Greetings. I've been scouring eBay for bargains again, and I found this strip light tube. And you think, wow, what's so, what's so special about a strip light tube? Well, this one is an ordinary strip light tube. That's just come out of my kitchen. This one isn't. I'll take it along, show you the edge. Whereas this one is just a conventional strip light tube, this one is an LED tube. Unlike the strip tube, this one uses no ballast. You just connect AC to each end of the tube. Although you can get some which are single-ended where you connect live and neutral on the one end and you leave the other end alone. This one is a double-ended tube. You wouldn't want to get them mixed up. So, how well does it work? Well, for that, I need two strip light fittings. As you can see, I've removed the high-frequency ballast from this one. I would like to compare with a third fitting with magnetic ballast, but I don't have any, so these will have to do. Let's see how good they are side by side. Now, on camera, the conventional tube appears brighter. When you're actually here in the flesh, there seems to be a much clearer light from the LED tube. I'll try messing with the iris on the camera to see if we can show it up a bit better. I have, I have zebra stripes on this camera which shows up when things are too bright for the image sensor and these tubes are pretty closely matched on here. There's a little bit of zebra striping on both sides. But all in all it's a pretty close match. I'm impressed. Let's give them both a few minutes to warm up. They've had time to warm up now. On the camera there's a bit more zebra striping on the left hand tube. The right hand tube isn't showing any at all now. But I'm not sure whether that's because the tube is brighter or because there's more brightness in a narrower tube. Remember the one on the left is a T8 tube. The one on the right is a T10. It's a wider tube. So it might be the same amount of light over a slightly bigger area. So what's in it? Well, there are only two Phillips screws on each end, so it'd be rude not to crack it open really, wouldn't it? Once you pop it open, you've got these three interconnected boards with connections going off at each end to a power supply underneath. To take a closer look at these boards and the power supplies, I'll have to desolder these connections on the end. Well, that's the LED strip removed. There's not much to see really. If you flip it over, it's just got all these big patches, which I assume are just for cooling, because they're not actually electrically connected to anything else. They're not actually connected to either of the supply wires. Each of the boards is 120 LEDs, and they're all grouped in blocks of 30. So for this board here, there's a group there, there's another group there, there's another group there, there's another group here. So if there's a failure in one LED, you will actually lose a quarter of a board, but you won't lose the entire panel. That leaves the power supply. If I desolder one leg, I can then slide the whole thing, in fact, both of them, Here are the power supplies. Presumably this is connected through to one of these legs and this one is also connected through to one of these legs so each of the supplies gets a live and a neutral. We get a live there and passes live along to the other one and this one has a neutral and that passes the neutral along to the other one. That's the part number on the sleeve. In the sleeve what we have this really slim line LED driver circuit I thought because of the way these boards are all interconnected that the power supplies would both feed all three boards 
they basically share the job. But taking a closer look at here, this point here, and these two banks are separate from these two banks. These ones are fed from that end, that one, those two are fed from that end. So each power supply is responsible for six blocks of LEDs, 180 LEDs per power supply. With each bank of 30 LEDs receiving about 95 volts. Comparing the tubes while they're sitting side by side in a pair of commercial light fittings is all well and good. How about in a domestic situation? Well, here's the before view with a Philips fluorescent tube and a Thorn high frequency ballast. And this is after with an Ecolite LED tube. By the way, this is a T10 tube fitting. If you're fitting it into a T8 lamp holder, you may need to butcher the lamp holder's ends to make it fit. Or it'll go straight into a T12, as you can see here. Or you can just buy the T8 version. Now you may have noticed that I have my power analyzer hooked up to those strip lights. And here are the results. You can see they've got quite a high inrush current of about 2.8 amps in the case of the Thorn electronic ballast and about 1.9 amps in the case of the Ecolite. Those are the peak currents though. The average current is a bit less. You can see that after the peak the Thorn starts off at about 0.2 amps and climbs up to just shy of 0.3 amps. The Ecolite stays pretty constant at about 0.14. The top two graphs show the power consumption. You can ignore the bottom one, that's just the total. This shows again the Thorn is starting off at just under 50 watts then climbs up to around about the 70 watt mark. Now this may not be spot on because those current clamps are designed for 3000 amps, not 300 milliamps. And you can see the Ecolite is drawing pretty much a constant 28 watts. And finally, for those of you who need really, really techy figures on these, here we also have the reactive power and the power factor. The power factor on the Thorn is about 0.95. It seems to be around about the 0.8 mark for the Ecolite. So now you know what's inside and how well they work. Thanks for watching.